Welcome back to Freshman English and our study of the Scarlet Ibis, and we are on page 391. We had some video um, audio issues, uh, and so now we're back. I am beginning now the audio at on page 391. Find it with me. That summer, the summer of 1918, was blighted, and blighted here means bad. Okay, so already this is going to be the foreshadowing in this story that this is going to be a tragic story. I'll just say it out loud, give you a little bit of a heads up of what's coming, because at this point, this has been a really remarkable story about two pros. So here we go. We're ready now with the rest of our, uh, of our audio files, or so I hope. That summer, the summer of 1918, was blighted. In May and June, there was no rain, and the crops withered, curled up, then died under the thirsty sun. One morning in July, a hurricane came out of the east tipping over the oaks in the yard and splitting the limbs of the elm trees. That afternoon, it roared back out of the west, blew the fallen oaks around, snapping their roots and tearing them out of the earth like a hawk at the entrails of a chicken. Cotton bowls were wrenched from the stalks and lay like green walnuts in the valleys between the rows, while the cornfield leaned over uniformly so that the tassels touched the ground. Doodle and I followed Daddy out into the cotton field, where he stood, shoulders sagging, surveying the ruin. When his chin sank down onto his chest, we were frightened, and Doodle slipped his hand into mine. Suddenly, Daddy straightened his shoulders, raised a giant knuckly fist, and with a voice that seemed to rumble out of the earth itself, began cursing heaven hell, the weather, and the Republican Party. Doodle and I, prodding each other and giggling, went back to the house, knowing that everything would be all right. And during that summer, strange names were heard through the house. Chateau Thierry, Amiens, Soissons. And in her blessing at the supper table, Mama once said, and bless the Pearsons, whose boy Joe was lost at Bellow Wood. World War I, right? So we came to that clove of seasons. School was only a few weeks away, and Doodle was far behind schedule. He could barely clear the ground when climbing up the rope vines, and his swimming was certainly not passable. We decided to double our efforts, to make that last drive and reach our pot of gold. I made him swim until he turned blue and row until he couldn't lift an oar. Wherever we went, I purposely walked fast, and although he kept up, his face turned red and his eyes became glazed. Once, he could go no further, so he collapsed on the ground and began to cry. Ah, come on, Doodle, I urged. You can do it. Do you want to be different from everybody else when you start school? Does it make any difference? It certainly does, I said. Now, come on, and I helped him up. As we slipped through dog days, Doodle began to look feverish, and Mama felt his forehead, asking him if he felt ill. At night, he didn't sleep well, and sometimes he had nightmares, crying out until I touched him and said, Wake up, Doodle, wake up. It was Saturday noon, just a few days before school was to start. I should have already admitted defeat, but my pride wouldn't let me. The excitement of our program had now been gone for weeks, but still we kept on with a tired doggedness. It was too late to turn back, for we had both wandered too far into a net of expectations and had left no crumbs behind. Daddy, Mama, Doodle, and I were seated at the dining room table having lunch. It was a hot day, with all the windows and doors open in case a breeze should come. In the kitchen, Aunt Nicey was humming softly. After a long silence, Daddy spoke. It's so calm, I wouldn't be surprised if we had a storm this afternoon. I haven't heard a rain frog, said Mama, who believed in signs, as she served the bread around the table. I did, declared Doodle down in the swamp. He didn't, I said contrarily. You did, eh? said Daddy, ignoring my denial. I certainly did, 
Doodle reiterated, scowling at me over the top of his iced tea glass, and we were quiet again. Suddenly, from out in the yard came a strange croaking noise. Doodle stopped eating, with a piece of bread poised ready for his mouth. His eyes popped round like two blue buttons. What's that? he whispered. I jumped up, knocking over my chair, and had reached the door when Mama called, pick up the chair, sit down again, and say, excuse me. By the time I had done this, Doodle had excused himself and had slipped out into the yard. He was looking up into the bleeding tree. It's a great big red bird, he called. The bird croaked loudly again, and Mama and Daddy came out into the yard. We shaded our eyes with our hands against the hazy glare of the sun and peered up through the still leaves. On the topmost branch, a bird the size of a chicken with scarlet feathers and long legs was perched precariously. Its wings hung down loosely, and as we watched, a feather dropped away and floated slowly down through the green leaves. It's not even frightened of us, Mama said. It looks tired, Daddy added, or maybe sick. Doodle's hands were clasped at his throat, and I had never seen him stand still so long. What is it? he asked. Daddy shook his head. I don't know. Maybe it's... At that moment, the bird began to flutter, but the wings were uncoordinated. And amid much flapping and a spray of flying feathers, it tumbled down, bumping through the limbs of the bleeding tree and landing at our feet with a thud. Its long, graceful neck jerked twice into an S, then straightened out, and the bird was still. A white veil came over the eyes, and the long white beak unhinged. Its legs were crossed, and its claw-like feet were delicately curved at rest. Even death did not mar its grace, for it lay on the earth like a broken vase of red flowers, and we stood around it, awed by its exotic beauty. It's dead, Mama said. What is it? Doodle repeated. Go bring me the bird book, said Daddy. I ran into the house and brought back the bird book. As we watched, Daddy thumbed through its pages. It's a scarlet ibis, he said, pointing to a picture. It lives in the tropics, South America to Florida. A storm must have brought it here. Sadly, we all look back at the bird. A scarlet ibis. How many miles it had traveled to die like this in our yard beneath the bleeding tree? Let's finish lunch, Mama said, nudging us back toward the dining room. I'm not hungry, said Doodle, and he knelt down beside the ibis. We've got peach cobbler for dessert, Mama tempted from the doorway. Doodle remained kneeling. I'm going to bury him. Don't you dare touch him, Mama warned. There's no telling what disease he might have had. All right, said Doodle. I won't. Daddy, Mama, and I went back to the dining room table, but we watched Doodle through the open door. He took out a piece of string from his pocket and without touching the ibis, looped one end around its neck. Slowly, while singing softly, shall we gather at the river, he carried the bird around to the front yard and dug a hole in the flower garden next to the petunia bed. Now we were watching him through the front window, but he didn't know it. His awkwardness at digging the hole with a shovel whose handle was twice as long as he was made us laugh, and we covered our mouths with our hands so he wouldn't hear. When Doodle came into the dining room, he found us seriously eating our cobbler. He was pale and lingered just inside the screen door. Did you get the scarlet ibis buried? asked Daddy. Doodle didn't speak, but nodded his head. Go wash your hands, and then you can have some peach cobbler, said Mama. I'm not hungry, he said.
Top of 394. And birds is bad luck, said Aunt Nicey, poking her head from the kitchen door. Especially red dead birds. As soon as I had finished eating, Doodle and I hurried off to Horsehead Landing. Time was short, and Doodle still had a long way to go if he was going to keep up with the other boys when he started school. The sun, gilded with the yellow cast of autumn, still burned fiercely. But the dark green woods through which we passed were shady and cool. When we reached the landing, Doodle said he was too tired to swim, so we got into a skiff and floated down the creek with the tide. Far off in the marsh, a rail was scolding, and over on the beach, locusts were singing in the myrtle trees. Doodle did not speak and kept his head turned away, letting one hand trail limply in the water. After we had drifted a long way, I put the oars in place and made Doodle row back against the tide. Black clouds began to gather in the southwest, and he kept watching them, trying to pull the oars a little faster. When we reached Horsehead Landing, Lightning was playing across half the sky, and thunder roared out, hiding even the sound of the sea. The sun disappeared, and darkness descended, almost like night. Flocks of marsh crows flew by, heading inland to their roosting trees, and two egrets, squawking, arose from the oyster rock shallows and careened away. Doodle was both tired and frightened. And when he stepped from the skiff, he collapsed onto the mud, sending an armada of fiddler crabs rustling off into the marsh grass. I helped him up, and as he wiped the mud off his trousers, he smiled at me ashamedly. He had failed, and we both knew it. So we started back home, racing the storm. We never spoke. What are the words that can solder cracked pride? But I knew he was watching me, watching for a sign of mercy. The lightning was near now, and from fear he walked so close behind me he kept stepping on my heels. The faster I walked, the faster he walked. So I began to run. The rain was coming, roaring through the pines. And then, like a bursting Roman candle, a gum tree ahead of us was shattered by a bolt of lightning. When the deafening peal of thunder had died, and in the moment before the rain arrived, I heard Doodle, who had fallen behind, cry out, Brother, brother, don't leave me! Don't leave me! The knowledge that Doodle's and my plans had come to naught was bitter, and that streak of cruelty within me awakened. I ran as fast as I could, leaving him far behind with a wall of rain dividing us. The drops stung my face like nettles, and the wind flared the wet, glistening leaves of the bordering trees. Soon, I could hear his voice no more. I hadn't run too far before I became tired, and the flood of childish spite evanesced as well. I stopped and waited for Doodle. The sound of rain was everywhere. But the wind had died, and it fell straight down in parallel paths like ropes hanging from the sky. As I waited, I peered through the downpour, but no one came. Finally, I went back and found him huddled beneath a red nightshade bush beside the road. He was sitting on the ground, his face buried in his arms, which were resting on his drawn-up knees. Let's go, Doodle, I said. He didn't answer, so I placed my hand on his forehead and lifted his head. Limply, he fell backwards onto the earth. He had been bleeding from the mouth, and his neck and the front of his shirt were stained a brilliant red. Doodle! Doodle! I cried, shaking him. But there was no answer but the ropey rain. He lay very awkwardly, with his head thrown far back, making his vermilion neck appear unusually long and slim. His little legs, bent sharply at the knees, had never before seemed so fragile, so thin. I began to weep, and the tear-blurred vision in red before me looked very familiar. Dude!
Pluto! I screamed above the pounding storm and threw my body to the earth above his. For a long, long time, it seemed forever, I lay there crying, sheltering my fallen scarlet ibis from the heresy of rain. All right, let's turn now to the text itself and let's ask some questions about why this story is going to emphasize issues for us of symbolism, all right? Um, what is it about this story that for us will almost immediately play into the study of symbolism? Now, no question, let's say this out loud. This is not a story as freshmen. This is not a story we give to seventh graders. For reasons that I think are somewhat self-evident, this is not a story we give to seventh graders. Why? Because they can't, they can't read a story? No, no. It's not a matter of them reading the story. It's a matter of them understanding a story like this, right? Because there's a lot going on in this story beneath the epidermal level. Hey, let's say this out loud at level one. Shall we just go ahead and qualify the story? Somebody asked you, what'd you do today in 303? Oh, we did this stupid story called the Scarlet Ibis. That's a strange name. What's it about? Well, can you put it in your notes in one line? It's a story about this kid named Doodle who ends up jacked at the end of the story. I mean, really, in the end, that's all this story is about, right? It's a story about a young kid who has a brother, and he teaches this brother how to do all this stuff, but Doodle, in the end, is just too fragile. He cannot sustain all of the intense training that his bro's going to give to him, and he ends up jacked. He ends up dead. Now, that literally is what happens in this story. This is a classic example of why we like to say there's multiple levels of reading. Because you can reduce all of the events of Scarlet Ibis from 12 pages, I think it is, that we said this story is, down to a single line. And you pretty much capture the whole, the whole story that way. And yet, now that you've read the story, you would say, no, 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 no. This story is about a whole lot more than just simply a kid named Doodle dying. This is a story called the Scarlet, Red, Ibis. And even now that we've said that, some of you immediately are recognizing the number of times in this story two things occur. Again, this is genius. We're looking at one of the classic stories of short fiction, right? I, I've had seniors who will tell me that in their four years of study, this was the story that most affected them once they allowed it to affect them to, because they began to think about it. Why? Well, think about it. Right in the title, there's two things that keep coming back in the story, like a mantra, like a gong that kind of goes off again and again and again. Two things. One, one the, the color red, scarlet, over and over and over again, right? We're seeing it again and again. And, of course, ibis is a bird. Notice how many times birds get mentioned in this story. This is all intentional, right, by the author. Now, of course, as freshmen, will ask this question at 2B. Uh, does this guy mean to do all the stuff that's going on? Well, let's say it out loud. This is what makes genius genius, okay? So as we look at the story, let me give you a classic example of what I mean. And we will do this, for example, when we study our Shakespeare later. When I teach you Romeo and Juliet, once we finish the text, we're going to go back and look at the opening lines and we're going to go, oh, it was all there. Play this game with me. One of the things I'm trying to challenge you here in our final moments in Unit 2, I'm trying to challenge you to appreciate genius. Anybody... I mean, can look at the sunset, but you got to appreciate the sunset. You get me? Watch the opening lines of the story, and they're all there. If you know how this story ends, going back and reading the opening lines makes you appreciate the genius. Read it with me. I'm on page 384. Go back to page 384 and read it with me. Go, go. I'm challenging you to do this. So we're now doing close reading. In other words, we know how the story ends. It's a dumb story about a kid that's jacked. We know that. But go back and look at the opening lines of the story and watch how already... James Hurst is setting you up for the final lines of the story. It was in the clove of seasons. Summer was dead. This is going to be a story about death, isn't it? But autumn had not yet been born that the ibis lit in the bleeding tree. Not the red tree, not the scarlet tree. The bleeding tree, of course, at the conclusion of the story, the blood will be coming out of Doodle's mouth. The flower garden was stained with rotting brown magnolia petals, and iron weeds grew rank amid the purple flocks. The five o'clocks by the chimney still marked time, but the oriole nest in the elm was untented and rocked back and forth like an empty cradle. 
the last graveyard flowers were blooming, and their smell drifted across the cotton field, and through every room of our house speaking softly the names of our dead. I use this story often when I lecture university classes to point out how prose and poetry, sometimes they're the same thing. What I just read is a prose poem in itself. Of course, think about all the things that are going on here. Empty nests, dead decaying flowers, rotting flowers. Remember, of course, Doodle and his casket, right, that he doesn't want to touch. Think about empty nests and the way that one works. All the symbolism that's going to play into this story is all right there already for us. And then, of course, we will have the key lines. Let's go back and look at several of those key lines. Note the irony on page 385. It was bad enough. Read the last lines. See, once you know how this story ends, all of these early lines become powerful lines. Read the last paragraph on 385 with me. It was bad enough having an invalid brother, but having one who was possibly not all there was unbearable. So I begin to make plans to kill him by smothering him with a pillow. Smothering him with a pillow? Killing him? Of course, the speaker of our story realizes he killed his bro, but how did he smother him? Not with a pillow, but with expectations. You're going to do this. You're going to learn how to walk. You're going to learn how to run. You're going to learn how to swim. Of course, he didn't realize it, but he was taking that fragile child and he was pushing him too hard. And of course, what's going to happen at the end? The child can't keep up. The next key line, page 386, go there, right? 